When we start using the term port numbers as it's associated with TCP IP, then we're generally talking about the port numbers that are used for TCP and the port numbers that are used for UDP. If you're communicating with a server to its IP address, then you're also communicating to it over a very particular port number. And on your client machine, there's also an IP address, obviously, on your client machine. And it's using a different port number to send that information out to the server. We will often refer to some of these port numbers as things like non-ephemeral port numbers, which means they are permanent. When we talk to a web server, we know that we're always going to talk to that web server on port 80. Port 80 would be a non-ephemeral port. This is usually something you'll always find on a server or it's on a service that's running on that server. There are also ephemeral ports. These are ports that we use to perform a particular function. And when we close that particular session, those ports go away. We'll pick another one from our big list to use next time we need to communicate out on the network. This is something that's done in real time. It's not something you need to configure. It's something that's done automatically by the TCP IP stack that happens to be in your device. And generally, it uses either sequential or random sets of numbers when we start looking at these ephemeral ports that we use every day. When you start looking at port numbers, you'll see that they are a number that is between 0 and 65,535. When we look at the servers and the non-ephemeral port numbers that they're using, just remember that it's just a number that we're choosing. We all got together, and we decided that if you're going to communicate to a web server, then we should all communicate to that web server on port 80. But the reality is that number could be anything we'd like. If we wanted to have our own web server somewhere, and we wanted to make that web server run on port number 8888, well, that's just fine. It will certainly run on that. Other devices will not know how to get to that web server unless we specifically tell them, oh, you need to use port 8888 to get to my web server, which is why these non-ephemeral port numbers are so useful, because we always generally know that a web server is going to be running port 80. So just keep in mind that that's only used for communication. Just by changing the port number doesn't make it more secure. It only changes what port number we're going to use to be able to access that device. And because of that, those standard port numbers need to be something called well-known port numbers. And in this video, we're going to go through a number of those well-known port numbers so that you can be familiar with what you'll see running out there. Also keep in mind that we're going to look at both TCP port numbers and UDP port numbers. And although TCP and UDP port numbers can be any number between 0 and 65535, they are very, very different in the way that they operate. A TCP port running on port 80 is completely different than a UDP port that might also be running on port 80. They are separate, although they have the same number associated with them. They are using completely different protocols to be able to communicate. If we were going to, for instance, from our workstation talk to a web server, this is a graphical way you may be able to see that. Your computer is 192.168.0.5. The web server is 192.168.0.10. And let's say we know this web server is using TCP port 80. So we're going to set up a flow. We're going to set up a session on our computer. We're going to communicate to that web server. And we're going to say, hey, web server, we're 192.168.0.5. I've set aside a port TCP port number 1331, and I'm going to send traffic over to you. Please send me a web page. And the web server is going to think about it. And when the web server sends a web page out, it knows to send it not only to 192.168.0.5, but it's going to send that web page very specifically to the port number that requested it, which was TCP 1331. When this machine receives that web page, it generally tears down the flow, tears down that session. And if we need to communicate to that web server again, we'll choose a different different port number, and we'll communicate back to the web server. Or maybe we're going to communicate down to the encrypted side of the web server, but we're going to use a different ephemeral port number every single time. Now we're going to go through a list of services and the port numbers associated with those services. And there is a lot here that you have to really just memorize. But the reality is you've probably already seen some of these port numbers in use. For instance, we've already talked about a web server using port 80 as its well-known port number. And the reality is also that you're going to use some of these port numbers in other ways, so that a lot of this won't be a rote memorization. You'll probably find you already know a number of these. Let's start with FTP. In an active FTP communication, there are two different port numbers that are used in TCP. 
One of those port numbers is used to send control information to the FTP server. The other port number is used to send data. So the TCP 20 is used for data, and TCP port 21 is used for that control information. If you're communicating to a server over a secure shell, a secure terminal connection, it uses TCP port 22. If you're using a terminal connection that is not encrypted, then you're probably using Telnet, and that uses TCP port 23. If you're transferring mail between devices, then you may be using SMTP, which stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, and that uses TCP port 25. You'll find DNS uses both TCP port numbers and UDP port numbers to communicate. Normally, when we're doing DNS lookups from our computer, it's the UDP side. But generally, you need to do a zone transfer between DNS servers. That zone transfer uses the TCP port of 53 to be able to use those zone transfers. HTTP, which we've already talked about, is a web server running the hypertext transfer protocol, and it uses TCP port 80. If you're using mail and you're using POP3 to retrieve your mail, that's our post office protocol version 3. It's generally using TCP port 110. If you're using IMAP4, which is a much smarter way to do mail in my opinion, but it is using more resources on the server with this Internet Message Access Protocol version 4, it's generally using TCP port 143 as its well-known port. And if we're doing encrypted web communication, then we're almost always using TCP port 443. Now let's move away from the TCP ports, and let's focus on some of the well-known UDP ports. We were just talking about DNS and how it uses zone transfers over TCP. But when you're doing normal DNS lookups from your computer, you're always using UDP to do that. And you're do using UDP over port 53 to make those queries. If you're using, when you start your machine, the boot P or the DHCP protocol to automatically get a IP address on your computer, that's the bootstrap protocol or the dynamic host configuration protocol, then you're using also a UDP port, UDP port 67, it's something that occurs behind the scenes before your machine even really gets going. There's also a couple of transfer protocols. We've talked about FTP on the TCP side. This is TFTP, which is a much simpler way of transferring files. It's called the Trivial File Transfer Protocol, and it uses the UDP protocols over port 69 to be able to communicate. When your machine is doing its updates of its clock, it's using a protocol called the Network Time Protocol, or NTP, and it uses UDP port 123. And lastly, with UDP, we have the Simple Network Management Protocol that generally is used behind the scenes for network administrators to be able to gather statistics from devices that are out on the network. And that SNMP protocol uses UDP port 161.